Welcome back. I'm Nicole Naditz, and I'm your host for this series of podcasts produced by the National Foreign Language Resource Center at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. This is the second episode in our seven-episode series focusing on performance assessments in world languages. In episode one, Paul Sandrock, the Director of Education at the American Council for Teaching of Foreign Languages and the author of Keys to Assessing Language Performance, provided a foundation for our work in this year's program on performance assessment, including integrated performance assessments. Integrated performance assessments are a powerful mechanism for gauging our learners' performance in contextualized and meaningful ways. But before we can get there to really talk about those and what those look like in world languages programs, we need a deep understanding of performance assessments in each mode of communication. So that brings us to this episode. In this episode, we will be focusing on performance assessments in the presentational mode. I am very pleased to welcome our special guest, Lynn Fulton. Lynn is the Education Specialist for, in Dual Language Immersion for the Delaware Department of Education. Thank you so much for joining us, Lynn. It's lovely to be here. I really look forward to the conversation. So do I. Um, so let's get started. As we get ready to really explore this topic of performance assessments in the presentational mode, it might be helpful to start by just reviewing the key characteristics of the presentational mode. What should educators keep in mind about this mode? Well, the presentational mode is, uh, is very much one-way communication. So where there's really very little interaction, if any, between the author or the presenter themselves and the audience. There's not an opportunity for the audience to really negotiate meaning with the presenter or for the presenter to get any real feedback from the audience. And when we look at the standards themselves, we see that the purpose of presentational communication is really to focus on informing, explaining, persuading, and narrating uh, a particular point of view um, or, you know, just sharing information in a variety of settings to a variety of audiences and in a variety of modes. So that might happen by speaking, it might happen through writing, or in the case of signed languages, it would happen through the actual signed language itself. And I think one of the things that's most important about the presentational mode is to remember that, especially from an assessment perspective, that the presentational mode is characterized by rehearsed and polished products. So students really need to have the opportunity to rehearse, to practice, to get feedback, to polish what it is that they're going to say, instead of just spontaneously being expected to produce language. And I think that brings up, you know, a really good point when it comes to how educators might approach these tasks when they are designed to be assessment tasks in that because the students are going to get, I mean, ideally, right, they're going to get opportunities for at least one, if not multiple drafts with feedback, opportunities to improve, enhance, refine, um, and polish their work there is a sense that often this results actually in a product that for teachers, it, it should be somewhat easier to grade as you're looking along at a, at a proficiency performance oriented rubric in the sense that students have had time to actually get their performance to their target and time to get feedback on it. And sometimes I think teachers or educators are a little bit taken aback by how well students are doing on the assessment tasks when the students have been given the time and the space and the resources and the feedback support to do that editing and refinement. Yeah, I agree completely. And I think that this is one of the one of the areas in which teachers have kind of had to challenge themselves and their beliefs about assessment mm -hmm. and feedback to learners. So we really always want to be focusing on what it is that the learner can do and what is the maximum that they're capable of. 
instead of looking at them and saying, oh, you didn't do this right or you didn't do this right, or it was just this one time that you missed, but really giving them the opportunity to practice and rehearse. And one of the things that I always say to um, any audience of language educators that I work with is that practice makes progress. And so the more opportunities that students have to practice and to rehearse what they're doing in their presentational um, assessment or in any presentational situation, they really are going to, that's when they progress in the language. Absolutely. And that actually kind of leads nicely into the next question because we're going to start looking at what these tasks might look like. What are the characteristics of a well-designed presentational task for novice learners and users of language, and then maybe kind of contrast that or compare that to what the characteristics of a well-designed task might be for intermediate and ultimately for advanced learners, for those who actually have the opportunity to have those long sequences of articulated language instruction. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that that's where we're always aiming. We're always aiming for advanced. And I'm really fortunate in the work that I do right now because we work within a system in, in my state that really is targeting advanced level language production by learners at the end of their K-12 career. But I think that there are some foundational characteristics that exist regardless of proficiency level of the learner. So um, it's important to keep a couple of things in mind. One, the language function is always going to be in the front of a, of a teacher's mind, in the front of an educator's mind as they design a task. So what is the actual task that the learner is carrying out and what's the purpose for communication, right? And then we also need to keep in mind the text type that can be expected from a learner. So that really relates to the quantity and the organization of the language that the learner is going to produce. And then another important characteristic is the aspect of language control. And that's where we start to think about issues of appropriateness of vocabulary. Um, at the novice level, we might see students choosing an inappropriate word where we might expect higher levels of appropriateness of vocabulary with increased proficiency levels. So as students move into intermediate and advanced, we, we want to see richer vocabulary, more appropriate vocabulary. And then there's the issue of accuracy. Um, and, and as learners go up, um, uh, by the time they get to advanced, we expect them to be very accurate. Um, oftentimes at the novice level, we see high levels of accuracy because learners are producing memorized chunks and they're not within a lot of context. They, I think the interesting thing is that oftentimes we see accuracy dip in the early levels of our intermediate learners uh, because that's when they're really creating with language and mm -hmm. creating with language and being original is really messy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no. And I was, I think that the, the, the proficiency level then really determines the amount of language and the amount and, and the context within a learner can operate, right? So when we think about a novice and we think about the characteristics of the novice proficiency level, then an integrated performance task or, or a presentational task um, that is related to the novice learner or appropriate for them is going to give them the opportunity to use a lot of memorized language. Um, there's probably not going to be a whole lot of original creation. When we think about the kind of language they're using, they're going to use words and phrases and simple sentences. And so those kinds of abilities with language lend themselves really well to tasks that might ask them to identify or label or caption, to write short sentences, to maybe illustrate a cartoon panel. Um, they might be able to write short notes about their themselves, their daily life, um, a short email, um, maybe a short discussion board post. And when we think about the context for a novice learner, the context is oftentimes very much about themselves, right? And what they know best is themselves and their immediate world. And so oftentimes that's where we see a lot of performance tasks coming from um, is, is can, what can they do to talk about and to write about and to share information and perspectives about themselves. Yeah, that's a really good point because we know that even in the other modes of communication too, we're really going to have to start by centering on what it is that 
they experience routinely, what they do routinely, their likes, their dislikes, their families, their, you know, this is where they're going to start. And that's where we're going to lay a foundation and build from, but we're going to start there. Um, in your experience, how can teachers make these presentational tasks more authentic? Perhaps even especially if we're looking sometimes at novice learners, what can we do to help make the tasks you know, represent authentic communication opportunities that learners with this range of proficiency might exhibit? Mm -hmm. Well, I think one of the most important things is for teachers to actually think about real world tasks and real world context. So where is it that a learner of this age, of this language ability, might actually interact with someone in the language? And really thinking about the purposeful use, right? Um, more and more we're seeing language curricula and language um, lessons designed around real world problems solving local problems. Um, so many secondary programs these days, and even a lot of elementary programs, have service learning components. So thinking about how can you identify community issues that might require the learner to uh, use a language other than English. Um, and then I think it's also really important to tap into your own student interests. I am a huge fan of surveying students during a particular unit to find out what personal connections they themselves have to the theme of the unit. I think that, um, that we can make tasks more authentic by actually involving the learner themselves in, um, in designing the task in giving students the opportunity to actually think about how is it that they might want to convey the information. Um, I've never been a fan of one size fits all. And uh, when we think about uh, presentational tasks, you know, it, we need to think about the strengths of our learners and what is going to give them the opportunity to really shine and to really purposefully use language. And then another thing that I see more and more happening is identifying situations where students can engage in peer-to-peer -peer presentations. So we have so much technology at our fingertips these days, and we have so many programs across the country that have established class-to-class -class relationships, whether that's a class in the United States with another class in a foreign country where the language is spoken, or even a class in the US with a similar class that is somewhere else in the United States. Um, I think sometimes we forget that language use across by students who are in the United States and learning the same language sometimes can produce some really interesting um, and some real authentic experiences for students. Where the target language becomes their common language. You know, exactly. Them. Exactly. And when, oh. Um, so that you almost led right into kind of a follow-up question I was headed towards. So I think we're going to go right to it, which is um, what, what about opportunities, what opportunities can teachers and educators provide for our learners to publish, produce, or share their presentational tasks with an authentic audience? Well, I certainly think that those peer-to-peer -peer relationships, so sister school relationships, international e-pals, et cetera, is one way to do that. But there, we, we live in such a multicultural and multilingual society today that it's quite possible for learners to publish and to use their language within their state or within their local community. Uh, I think about my own individual context and you know, I, we have learners who can use their Spanish with the Spanish speaking community locally. They can use their Chinese with the Chinese speaking community locally. Uh, we have a large Haitian Creole population that also speaks French. And so we have a lot of community outreach opportunities where we have students in intermediate and advanced level language courses where they're actually creating materials that can be shared out locally in the community with our Haitian Creole speaking community, uh, with their French exchange students, with their Japanese sister school, um, and things like that. 
Uh, so, so we're no longer limited just by um, what is it that the teacher is going to see. And we have so many virtual platforms on which students can share information and where they can access information that creating a blog post, creating some sort of an informational flyer, creating something that can go out to the community is much easier these days. And that publishing piece um, can happen much more readily than it used to be. Right. And I will say, and I am actually one, we know each other, we've known each other for a long time. Um, but, you know, my I was definitely really harnessed technology to help my students really be part of a global community of French speakers. That said, one of the other things we just want to make sure we leave our listeners with and viewers with is as you're doing that, do be thoughtful about rules protecting your students' privacy and making sure that if necessary, you have secured the appropriate permissions of families and so on. If students like names or faces will be visible to people outside of your classroom and so on, just because we have to make sure we, we take care of those needs as well. Um, because technology makes it so easy for us to connect and we want to do that. We just want to do it in a way that is safe. Have you come across any common kind of pitfalls that, that maybe take away from the authenticity of tasks that you've seen perhaps used for presentational mode in classes? Yeah, I have. I think that um, one of the common pitfalls, in, and, and, and I don't know that we're seeing this quite as much these days with some shifts in curricula and some shifts in overall programmatic design, but um, I think any time that we put a student in a situation where they wouldn't normally find themselves, based on their age or their proficiency or their interests, I think that that then can detract from the, uh, from the learning and from the presentation itself. Um, so, for example, um, I remember back to my days of language learning when I actually had to be the airline host. Yes, I was going to say. <laughs> Unless I'm a college student or even a high school student who has advanced language in a career and technical path where I might be going into hotel and hospitality and tourism, that's really not an authentic task for me and it's not a real world task for me. Um, I also think that when we create tasks that don't have a clearly identified audience other than the teacher, um, I think that that, is, that that can be a downfall for learners and that can kind of take away some of the motivation. When we can identify a real authentic audience, when we can identify a real world use for language, then that's when we tend to get greater buy-in from students, more motivation for them. Uh -huh. And then this kind of references back to something that I said before, but I think not providing students with options for the way that they present information, um, so only accepting a single type of response sometimes um, is not necessarily conducive to those students being engaged the entire time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I've um, said myself, you know, the, there is an important, a really true importance to designing tasks that, for, that are for an audience beyond the teacher and a purpose greater than a grade. Right, so students see right there within the context that you've laid out for the task. And I think that's part of the point you're bringing up too, is that these tasks need to be situated within a context that makes sense to the learners, right? So that learners can actually see themselves taking the language they have and what they can do, right? And really doing these things with their, with their, with their language skills. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, how can teachers provide learners with opportunities to embed their developing intercultural knowledge in their presentational tasks? Well, again, I think a lot of this goes back to audience. So when we think about interculturality, um, we, we definitely think about when are the opportunities that we have, what are the opportunities that we have to interpret information um, and to demonstrate our own knowledge and understanding and the development of our understanding of the culture's perspectives and of another speaker's perspective. Um, I think also giving students opportunities to synthesize their learning, so comparing and contrasting, and then trying to think about the why behind something that might be different. 
And this doesn't have to just be with students, again, in other countries or other locations. More and more, we know that there are opportunities for students to interact with the language that they're learning within their state, their community, or even their school. And the other important thing to note, I think, about that intercultural knowledge is to really think about what is the expected intercultural knowledge or ability of a learner based on their proficiency? Because we do want them demonstrating that intercultural knowledge in the target language, in the language that they're learning. And so um, I think a wonderful resource for this are the uh, 2017 Necessful Actful Can Do Statements, which have the intercultural component directly embedded. And I think that those give a really nice opportunity for educators to look and say, how do students, uh, how do students uh, present information about their intercultural knowledge and how do they interpret or interact? So, for example, a novice learner might identify products and practices that then help inform their perspective. At the intermediate level, then students really are doing a lot more making comparisons and looking and diving into those comparisons to inform their perspectives. And then at the advanced level, students are really explaining the diversity that exists between products and practices and the perspectives that lie behind them within the target culture, within the community of target language speakers, and then within their first language. Absolutely. And actually, having brought up those um, necessful, actual, can-do statements, I'll just say that we will be able to attach those as a linked resource to this episode so that teachers who would like to dive back into them if they've already seen them or who have never seen them before will be able to find them really easily. Um, so we talked about one of the important characteristics of performance assessments is the fact that these are these tasks are the kinds of tasks that students have the time and space and support to do multiple drafts, to edit, to practice, to rehearse, to get feedback, rehearse again, refine or rewrite or re-record and so on before they submit their tasks. So do you have any strategies that you suggest to teachers in order to ensure that learners have these multiple opportunities to edit and refine their product and maybe even get obviously feedback multiple times without it seeming like an overwhelming task for teachers to provide individual personalized feedback every time on every draft, do you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the first thing that teachers need to think about is actually planning for revision and rehearsing. Uh, and, and oftentimes we think, oh, I'm going to give students, you know, I'm going to give them a class period to do this presentational task. Well, there's no way that one single class period, even if you're in a 90 minute block um, from an instructional perspective, where that's going to give students the opportunity to draft, get feedback, for a teacher to be able to provide feedback to every learner, et cetera. And so I think that that idea of really planning from the beginning and thinking about when does the presentational task begin? When do we start to think about it? How, on which days and in which portions of my lesson are learners going to have the opportunity to submit something to me or to their classmates? And right. what does that feedback cycle look like? So how do I draft, submit, receive feedback, revise, submit, receive additional feedback? And then the other important thing is to make sure that you have a very clear proficiency focused communication based rubric that students then can start to look and identify that and give some feedback to themselves, right? Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that you kind of mentioned is that it shouldn't always be the teacher that's providing the feedback to learners. And I think that we have some real opportunity in the world language field to draw upon resources from our colleagues in English language arts and even our colleagues who work with English learners to really look at protocols at, that they have set up to capitalize on peer-to-peer -peer feedback opportunities to provide students with peer conferencing checklists uh, so that a student knows, okay, my partner's going to do this and this is my job while they present, right? And that could be as simple as a yes, no checklist, a series of questions where I can say yes, to what degree they did this 
they didn't do this, they did it somewhat, they did it really well, etc. And then one of my favorite strategies is actually something called a successive conversation strategy that Jeff Swears created and, um, and shares whenever he talks about academic language. And this really is a conversation protocol that can help students refine and clarify their ideas. So they engage in multiple conversations with different partners. They get feedback from each partner. And then during each conversation, the student takes notes that, uh, that come from their partner. But the whole goal is always to make their idea and their message stronger and clearer. So when each I time, think of, Like each time as they go from partner to partner based exactly. on the- Exactly. So every time they go from partner to partner. So I'll talk to you as my partner. I'll take your feedback. I might sit back down and take five to seven minutes to actually go back and incorporate your feedback into my piece. And then, and that's, that's your whole class. And then I do it a second time and I get additional information. How can I make this stronger and clearer based on your feedback? And then usually there's a third round of that as well. Right. So, and going back, I actually really like that. I don't know if, if, is there something publicly available from Jeff Swears that we'd be able to link? There is. So that's one of the links that I'll make sure that, 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 uh, that viewers have the opportunity to access. There are some wonderful resources around how do you make those messages stronger and clearer? What are the protocols that you put into place? And what are the resources, the note cards, et cetera, that students would actually use through that process? Right. That's really interesting. And I think something you said earlier on in your response is it also bears drawing out a little bit for the people listening and viewing. And that is that it's not going to be something where we can say, at least very rarely, if ever, where we can say, okay, class, you're going to do your draft today and then you'll do your final tomorrow. Right. Because there, you have to plan, as Lynn was saying, you have to plan for this. So part of that planning includes if I, as the teacher, am the one giving the feedback, I need to look at it and go, wait, draft A or draft A of part A of their thing, even maybe it's only a piece is going to come in at this time. I'm going to give them feedback and return it to them. And it might be two days later or three days later when they have a chance to come back into that draft and continue refining it, building it, adding to it and so on that it won't necessarily be over consecutive days because it's really difficult for learners to get the feedback and the practice that they need in order to truly get their product to the place where they want it to be for that presentational task. Exactly. And I think, again, that comes back to that idea of planning. So teachers mm-hmm. need to be creative in thinking about a presentational task might actually take a full week for learners to get through. Um, and so they might not be working on it every minute of the entire week. So teachers need to think about how are they going to fill those times when feedback is being provided, where, uh, where there's a down day, where, uh, where the teacher is looking at information or where students are simply drafting and revising again. So given that nearly all schools will be commencing this fall with probably some kind of blended or distance learning in place. Maybe it's a hybrid model where students are in school two days a week and learning from home three days a week. A lot of schools are still deciding how this is going to look, but it looks likely that there will be some distance learning involved um, for our learners. What strategies do you recommend for leveraging technology for these performance assessment tasks? Well, I think that one of the most important things is to actually look for platforms when we're thinking about presentational tasks, to look for platforms that support one-way communication. Uh, and, and don't reinvent the wheel. Um, there are so many educators out there, you being one of them, who have created resources and who have just kind of mined all kinds of technological applications to say, these ones are great for presenting, these are great for interpersonal communication, these are great for presentational tasks, etc. Right? For as much as we want to keep uh, materials in the target language, the platform itself can be language agnostic, 
right? Because what we're really looking at is the language that the student is producing. So it's not like that if you're a German teacher, you have to go find some German technology platform for students to use, right? So really to think about what are those platforms that support one-way communication. Um, I also think that it's really important to leverage student input. Um, with regards to platforms, so what if you're a middle or a high school teacher, survey your learners. What are the platforms that they're currently using? Um, are those, can you find a way for students to leverage those themselves? Um, and remember that you don't have to be an expert in the technology yourself for a student to be able to use it and to capitalize on its potential and its ability for them to be able to share information via technology. Right, and that even goes back to what you were saying earlier about providing students with options in terms of how they might produce their performance assessment task and share it out with you. Um, I think that there's a role for that choice of tool if technology is going to be used to play, especially in the case of the kinds of media that students would be using to design their presentational tasks. Typically, the student is able to easily share them with just a link. And so even the teacher doesn't often need a lot of additional technology support in order to access that presentational task and watch it or listen to it and provide feedback using the rubric that they had already established that they would use. Mm -hmm. And I also think that it's really important. I, I can't think of many school districts nationally that haven't leveraged technology to a certain degree within some sort of a learning management system. And so I think it's really important that teachers actually engage in professional learning around their district or their school-based learning management platform. Because oftentimes there are untapped resources within that and that resource itself, that platform itself can serve a myriad of purposes. So again, it goes back to that idea of not needing to reinvent the wheel, really to capitalize and leverage what you have at your fingertips, engage in professional learning around that platform, capitalize on the technology specialists that are in your district, that are in your school, that can really support you and let them be a thought partner around this is what I'd like for my students to do. How, is there something that we already have at our fingertips that we can use to accomplish this task? That's a really good point. Um, there are so many features of the tools that districts make available to all of their staff that, as you said, often go untapped and people don't realize that they have them. Are there any last thoughts that you have regarding the design and implementation of presentational tasks, especially in the face of distance learning before we wrap, as we wrap this up? Well, I think that as we think about the start of, of new programs or any time that distance learning is, is in place, um, taking time to establish protocols and common expectations for among your learners is really important. Um, there's never a guarantee that the class that you have this year is going to have any students in it that you actually know. They might be all new learners to you. And relationships are key to success in a language learning environment. And so I think oftentimes teachers think, no, I don't have the time to spend on this. But I would almost say that investing the time up front is time that you can't afford not to spend. Um, uh, it's certainly not a waste of time. Spending that time up front will, in the end, save you time later on. And without relationships, learning really isn't, really isn't going to happen. Um, and then I think one of the things that, that has kind of become clear, uh, at least in my state, uh, over the course of, of, of recent events, is that access to technology is not universal. We still have, you know, internet deserts and technology deserts and areas where students don't have access to technology um, for whatever reason. And so I think it's important for, uh, for world language educators to think about, is there a no tech option? What might be a low tech option? And what might be a high tech option for a presentational task? Um, 
And then in distance environments, teachers might need to consider providing extended time for task completion. Um, you know, I, I think one of the things that was uh, that 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 I've that I've seen recently was every teacher decided they needed to overload learners, and um, and students were saying, "I have so much more expectations of my time now than I ever had before." So I think it's important to 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 kind of think about that, and then be creative with finding ways to still provide peer-to-peer -peer feedback opportunities. So opportunities for learners, for students to talk to their classmates and their peers and to get that feedback from them. You can do that through, if you are able to use technology and you have breakout room capabilities and a distance learning platform, you could have peer-to-peer -peer emails that could happen. Um, so it doesn't have to be live time, synchronous. They can be in asynchronous feedback as well from peer-to-peer. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like using the collaborative tools even in Google Doc. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Um, and that actually goes back, you know, providing those opportunities, whether it's in a breakout room or in an asynchronous, you know, non-speaking type tool like Google Docs and so on, goes back actually to what you were saying about relationship building, because a key part of that relationship is that the students feel that they are number one part of a community that it isn't just them and the teacher. So yes, we want that really strong, solid relationship where students feel welcomed and valued and respected by their teachers and vice versa. But we also want them to feel like they're part of a larger community of learners that they see themselves as being connected to. Um, and that's, that's another critical piece and providing those opportunities for them to do peer feedback can actually help keep them connected. It's also really important because there's a risk of um, kind of tech in isolation. And this is something that's starting to come out more and more in the research where we want to engage learners in co-using technology as part as a social construct so that they aren't just designing, reading, consuming, creating, producing, and so on completely in isolation. Um, and instead we want them collaboratively engaging in these, if we're going to be using these technologies um, when we do do the low tech or higher tech options as, as opposed to the no tech options, um, that they're doing it in collaborative ways. And the, that's gonna go a really long way towards helping them kind of maintain their progress and their investment in these courses, even if our courses are required to have a distance learning component going forward. Yeah. And the extended time that you said, um, the thing that came apparent, became apparent in my district, and I think as you were saying in a lot of districts and in a lot of states, was not only was it the sudden like influx of, and now we're all having, you know, every one of my high school classes decided they wanted their Zoom meeting at 9 a.m. on Tuesday and, you know, navigating all of that, plus the additional work and the asynchronous work. And they're thinking, wow, I mean, I didn't realize how much there would be, but also keeping in mind that families might have limited access to technology. There might be multiple students in the household using the one device and the, your student's sibling happens to need the device for their own asynchronous learning or for their Zoom or Google Google Meets, you know, events and so on. And that becomes another reason why providing a kind of flexible extended time, like here's the week's worth of work, you'll need to have the following things done and submitted by X date. You can do them sooner, but here's a range of time during which you can complete those tasks is going to be really important. Yeah, and I think that, I, I think the key word right there, Nicole, is flexibility. Um, I think that we have all uh, learned how to be more flexible, but I even think that as we move forward, we're really going to have to be thinking about that. So are there opportunities for a teacher when you are in a remote environment to offer a synchronous live session right. that's shorter than a normal class period, right. but maybe it happens two or three times in a day? Um, or maybe it right. happens one day at one time and the next day at a different time, specifically to take into consideration those issues of there is one computer or there are three children who suddenly have all been told you all have to be online at 9 a.m., et cetera. <laughs> yes. So really thinking about that flexible mindset, it will be really important.
Mm -hmm. And we still know we have a lot of unanswered questions about what the fall and even the rest of the school year is going to look like. But I think these are really helpful things that you're bringing out for us to keep in mind as we go into designing these learning experiences all the way up to and including the assessment experiences that our learners are going to have. So I really want to thank you so much for taking this time out of your day to share with us this wealth of knowledge that you've brought from your experience in your own teaching and in all of the classrooms you've had the opportunity to observe and mentor and work with. I think our um, viewers and listeners are going to find this really exceptionally valuable. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you. I have really enjoyed the conversation. Um, I think preparing for things like this always makes me push my thinking and yes. find new resources. And, um, and I certainly look forward to sharing some additional resources that people might not know about um, in, in, in some of the links that go out um, along with this. Thank you again also for that. That's going to be something that I hope everybody will look for um, attached to this episode. And please be sure to join us for our next episode, which will be the first of two parts focusing on performance assessments in the interpersonal mode. And for the next episode, that first part of the time that we'll be talking about the interpersonal mode, our guest will be Iman Hashem. So I hope you will all come back and join us for that episode. Thanks everybody.